Later, Gordon steamed into the yard at the big station. That's what I need, exclaimed Gordon. There, emerging out of the sheds, were two shiny tenders. Now, if I had two tenders, said Gordon, I wouldn't need to stop so often and I wouldn't have to listen to silly little engines. Those tenders belong to a visitor, replied his driver. Diesel sidled up alongside. Everyone knows that tenders are a mark of distinction, but I'm afraid that no amount of tenders will save you in the end. We diesels are taking over and we don't need tenders to make us important, not even one. Gordon was most upset. He backed down onto his train, hissing mournfully. Cheer up, Gordon, said the fat controller. I can't, sir. Is it true what Diesel says, sir? What does he say? That Diesels are taking over. Don't worry, Gordon, that will never happen on my railway. And one more thing, sir. Why did the visitor have two tenders? Because he lives on a railway with long distances between coal and depots. Gordon felt better. But Henry stops at complaining. He banged some trucks angrily. I always work hard enough for two, he puffed. I deserve another tender. Duck whispered something to Donald. He was going to play a trick on Henry. Henry, he asked innocently, would you like my tenders? Yours? What have you got to do with tenders? All right, said Duck. The deal's off. Would you like them, Donald? I wouldn't need a private of the honour, replied Donald. It is a great honour, continued Duck thoughtfully, but I'm only a tank engine. Perhaps James might. I'm sorry I was rude, said Henry hastily. How many tenders have you, and when could I have them? Er, uh, mm, I have six, and you can have them this evening. Six lovely tenders, chortled Henry. What a splendid sight I'll be. Henry was excited all day. Do you think it'll be all right? He asked for the umpteenth time. Of course, said Duck. They're all ready now. The other engines waited where they could each get a good view. But Henry wasn't a splendid sight at all. His six tenders were very old, dirty and filled with boiler sludge. Had a good washout, Henry, called a voice. That's right, you'll feel a different engine now. He was just shunting, ready for his return journey, when... That sounds like a steam engine, he thought. The hiss came again. Who's there? asked Douglas. A whisper came, are you a fat controller's engine? I am Prudy. Thank goodness. I'm Oliver, and I'm with my brake van Toad. We've run out of coal and have no more steam. But what are you doing? Escaping. From what? Scrap. Douglas shivered. Then he remembered Edward's story about saving Trevor. I'll be glad to help you, he said. It'll have to look as if you're ready for scrap, and I'm taking you away. The drivers and firemen agree to help too. Everyone work fast. No time to turn around, panted Douglas. I'll run tender first. Come on. But before they could clear the station, they were stopped. Aha! exclaimed a foreman. A Great Western engine and a brake van too. You can't take these. Ah, but they're all for us, said Douglas's driver. See for yourself. The foreman looked all over Oliver. Seems in order. Right, away guard. It's a neat thing, puffed Douglas. We've had worse, 
smiled Oliver. And they forged ahead. It was daylight when their journey ended. We're home, cried Douglas. Shh, said his driver. There are the works. We'll find a place for Oliver. Oliver said goodbye and thank you, and Douglas puffed away. The next day, Douglas told the other engines all about Oliver. The fat controller will have to know, said James. Douglas should tell him at once, added Gordon. Well, here he is said a voice. Now, what's this all about? Beg pardon, sir, but we do need another engine. Yes, sir, ventured Gordon. A steam engine, sir. I'm afraid that unless one is saved from scrap, there's little hope. But, sir, burst out Douglas, one has. Yes, indeed. And thanks to you, Douglas, he is now at our works. Oliver is just what we need for Duck's branch line. The vicar says that not all children are able to have holidays by the sea, so he's having a garden party to raise money for a seaside trip. I'm going to be the star attraction, chattered Trevor, giving rides to all the visitors. The vicar is putting up posters all about it. I'd like to help too, sighed Edward, but without my rails I wouldn't be much good at a garden party. The vicar's been so busy he forgot to put up the posters. Now no one will know about the party. But Edward had an idea. Don't worry, he said. Everything is going to be all right. Then he explained to his driver. The vicar can paste his posters on my cab and coaches, so wherever I go, they'll go too. Well done, Edward, said his driver. I'm sure the fat controller will agree, as indeed he did. Edward steamed happily through the stations, collecting his passengers. Look, they said, the vicar is holding a party. We must go to that. Later, Trevor was resting in the orchard shed when Bertie rolled by. Hello, Trevor. Why are you dozing there like an old stick in the mud? I'm not dozing. I'm resting, replied Trevor. Then he told Bertie about the vicar's party. I'll be there too, boasted Bertie. I'm not sure people will want to ride on an old traction engine after travelling in a smart red bus like me. The party day arrived. It had rained heavily during the night and the orchard ground was sodden. Rain and mud won't spoil my day, said Trevor. No, indeed, agreed his driver. We'll stay on the road, then we won't get bogged down. Trevor was soon busy trundling up and down the quiet country lane, carrying lots of laughing children. He was just turning a corner when he heard Bertie. Hello, old timer. I'm taking everyone to the party. Edward's idea is really working. Trevor gave Bertie a cheerful whistle and turned back toward the orchard. Then there was trouble. Help! I'm stuck! shouted Bertie. His wheels had sunk deep in the orchard mud. Terence the tractor arrived just in time. I'm the one who has to plough fields, laughed Terence. We'd better get you out. Using strong ropes, Terence and Trevor pulled Bertie clear of the mud. James bustled in. What's that, duck? He snorted. Are you afraid of bees? They're only insects after all, so don't let that buzzbox diesel tell you different. His name is Boko, and he didn't. We... I wouldn't care, interrupted James. If hundreds were swarming around, I'd just blow smoke and make them buzz off. Buzz, 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 retorted Duck. The next morning, James arrived at the station to collect his coaches. The passengers were excited and keen to get on board. The platform was crowded and the porter was in a hurry. Mind your backs, he shouted. Then there was trouble. The beehive fell and broke open. The station cleared like magic. 
James heard a familiar buzzing. The bees were too cold to be cross, so they buzzed around the fireman hoping he'd mend their hive, but he didn't understand, nor did his driver. So the bees turned to James. His boiler was nice and warm. Buzz off! Buzz off! Yes, James. One bee burnt his foot. Ooh, ah, phew, phew. The bee thought James had burnt him on purpose. So it stung James right back on the nose. Eee! Whistled James. He had had enough. So had his fireman and driver. They didn't notice till too late that they had left all their coaches behind. They tried everything to get rid of the bees. First, they spun on the turntable to no avail. They tried washing them off, but the bees clung harder to James's warm boiler. Then, they tried smoking them off by going through a long tunnel. But still, the bees wouldn't go away. It's no good, James, said his driver. We'll just have to go back to the orchard and fetch another hive. James's reply was drowned by the sound of buzzing. The vicar was waiting anxiously for James. When he arrived, the bees swarmed straight into their new home. Come on, James, said his driver. What you need now is a good hose down. Later that evening, James was resting in the shed when the vicar came to see him. Thank you for saving my bees, he said. It's a pity it's not Christmas, then we could call you James the Red-Nosed Engine. Everyone laughed, even James. But instead, they decided to call James the Bee's Knees, which means they thought he was more useful than ever. Every evening, the two engines pull two fast trains from the station. Gordon always leaves first with an express for the main line. Edward follows five minutes later with his train for the branch line. Usually everything runs like clockwork, but tonight there was trouble. A lady in a green floppy hat was saying goodbye to a friend. It was nearly time for Gordon to start. The fireman looked back towards the guard's van and saw something green waving. Right away, mate. He thought the guard had waved his flag. Gordon started, leaving luggage, his passengers and the guard all standing on the platform. Everyone was very surprised and cross. To make matters worse, by the time Gordon had been stopped and brought back, Edward was already late with his train. So now he set off first. But the signalman at the junction wasn't told about the change. By mistake, he sent Edward along the main line. Gordon was sent along the branch and arrived cold and cross on one of the sidings near the harbour. Next morning, Bill and Ben peeped into the yard. There were no trucks for them, but they didn't mind that. Teasing Gordon would be much better fun. What's that? asked Bill. Shh, whispered Ben. It's Gordon. It looks like Gordon, but it can't be. Gordon never comes on the branch lines. He thinks them vulgar. Gordon pretended he hadn't heard them. If it isn't Gordon, said Ben, it's just a pile of old iron, which we'd better take to the scrapyard. No, Bill, this lot's useless for scrap. We'll take it to the harbour and dump it in the sea. Gordon was alarmed. I am Gordon. Stop! Stop! When Boko suddenly arrived, Gordon thought him the most beautiful sight he had ever seen. Boko, my dear engine, save me! Boko quickly sized up the situation. 
and threatened to take away the trucks he had brought for Bill and Ben. This made the twins behave at once. Gordon thought he was wonderful. Bill and Ben were delighted to see the visitors. They loved being photographed. Later, they took the party to the China Clayworks in a brake van special. Everyone had a splendid time, and the visitors were most impressed. Then Edward took the visitors home. On the way, the weather changed. Wind and rain buffeted him. His sanding gear failed, and his fireman rode in front, dropping sand on the rails by hand. Suddenly, Edward's wheels slipped fiercely. With a shrieking crack, something broke. The crew inspected the damage. Repairs took some time. One of your crank pins broke, Edward, said his driver. We've taken your side rods off. Now you're like an old-fashioned engine. Can you get these people home? They must start back tonight. I'll try, sir, promised Edward. Edward puffed and pulled his hardest, but his wheels kept slipping and he could not start the heavy train. The passengers were anxious. Driver, fireman and guard went along the train, making adjustments between the coaches. We've loosened the couplings, Edward. Now you can pick your coaches up one by one, just as you do with trucks. That will be much easier, said Edward. Come on, he puffed, and moved cautiously forward. The first coach moving helped to start the second, and the second helped the third. I've done it! I've done it! puffed Edward. Steady, boy, warned his driver. Well done, boy. You've got them! You've got them! And he listened happily to Edward's steady beat as he forged slowly but surely ahead. At last, battered, weary, but unbeaten, Edward steamed in. Henry was waiting for the visitors with the special train. Peep, peep! The fat controller angrily pointed to the clock, but excited passengers cheered and thanked Edward. He liked running at night. The rails hummed and the signal light shone green. But a broken cartload of lime lay ahead. Sam the farmer had just gone for help. Percy broke the car to smithereens. Lime flew everywhere. He puffed quickly to the nearest signal box. Percy's driver explained what had happened. I'll see to it, said the signalman, but you'd better clean Percy or people will think he's a ghost. Percy chuckled. Do let's pretend I'm a ghost and scare Thomas. That'll teach him to say I'm a silly little engine. Toby promised to help. Thomas was being oiled up for his evening train. Percy's had an accident, cried Toby. Poor engine, said Thomas. Botheration! That means I'll be late. They've cleared the line for you, but there's something worse. Out with it, Toby. I can't wait all evening. I've just seen something, said Toby. It looked like Percy's ghost. It said it was, was coming here to, to, to warn us. Huh, who cares? Don't be frightened, Toby. I'll take care of you. Percy. No, no, not by the smoke of my chimney chim chim. 
I'll chuff and I'll puff and I'll break your door in. Oh dear, exclaimed Thomas. It's getting late. Oh, I'd no idea. Oh, I must find Annie and Clarabel. It was morning when Thomas returned. Where have you been? asked Toby. Ah, well, said Thomas. I knew you'd be sad about Percy, and I, uh, I didn't like to intrude. I slept in the good shed, and... Oh, sorry, can't stop. Got to see a coach about a train. Whee! Percy gave a ghostly whistle. Don't be frightened, Thomas, he laughed. It's only me. Your ugly fizz is enough to frighten anyone, said Thomas. You're like ugly indeed. I'm a green caterpillar with red stripes, continued Thomas firmly. You crawl like one too. I don't. Who's been late every afternoon this week? It's the hay. I can't help that, said Thomas. Time's time and the fat controller relies on me to keep it. I can't if you crawl in the hay till all hours. Green caterpillar indeed, fumed Percy. He set off to collect some hay to take to the harbour. Everyone says I'm handsome, or at least nearly everyone. Anyway, my curves are better than Thomas's corners. Thomas says I'm always late, he grumbled. I'm never late, or at least only a few minutes. What's that to Thomas? He can always catch up time further on. All the same, he and his driver decided to start home early. Then came trouble. A crate of treacle was upset all over Percy. Percy was cross. He was still sticky when he puffed away. The wind was blowing fiercely. Look at that, exclaimed the driver. The wind caught the piled hay, tossing it up and over the track. The lion climbed here. Take a run at it, Percy, his driver advised. Percy gathered speed, but the hay made the rails slippery and his wheels wouldn't grip. Time after time, he stalled with spinning wheels and had to wait till the line ahead was cleared before he could start again. Everyone was waiting. Thomas seethed impatiently. Ten minutes late, I warned him, passengers will complain and the fat controller. Then they all saw Percy. They laughed and shouted. Sorry I'm late, Percy panted. Look what's crawled out of the hay, teased Thomas. What's wrong, asked Percy. Talk about hairy caterpillars, puffed Thomas. It's worth being late to have seen you. Thomas collected the tree safely, but large snowdrifts lay ahead. I mustn't be late, he thought. The fat controller is relying on me. Whistling bravely, Thomas tried to move, but he couldn't. There was worse to come. Poor Thomas was snowed under. Meanwhile, the other engines waited and waited. They were grumbling about Thomas for being late. Silence, said the fat controller. Thomas left the work safely, but snow has brought the telephone lines down. We must assume he is stranded. The engines now felt sorry for Thomas, and cold but confident, the twins set off to the rescue. Suddenly, they came to a drift that was deeper than the rest. Hush! said Donald. I can hear something. Probably the wind, said Douglas. Help. No, listen, insisted Donald. Over here. Look, it's Thomas. Come on, 
The poor wee engine must be frozen to the frames in there. When the workmen arrived, it took some time to decide how to dig away the heavy drifts of snow. Thomas's driver and fireman, who had taken shelter at a nearby cottage, joined the rescue. At last, Thomas and the precious Christmas tree were freed from the snowdrift. Then they set off once more to finish their long journey. The fat controller greeted them warmly. As a reward for all your hard work, you may go and enjoy the carols. Be quick now. At the big station, all was soon ready. One, two, three. Suddenly, like magic, the station was flooded with lights. Ladies, gentlemen, and children, I give you three cheers for Thomas the Tank Engine and all his friends who have made this occasion possible. Percy was left alone. He didn't mind that a bit. He liked watching trains and being cheeky to the other engines. Hurry, 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 he would call, and they got very cross. After a great deal of shunting, Percy was waiting for the signalman to set the point so that he could get back to the yard. He was eager to work, but was being rather careless and not paying attention. Edward had warned Percy, be careful on the main line, whistle to the signalman you are there. But Percy didn't remember to whistle, so the busy signalman forgot him. Percy waited and waited. The points were still against him, so he couldn't move. Then he looked along the main line. Peep, peep! He whistled in horror, for rushing straight towards him was Gordon with the express. my way! Percy opened his eyes. Gordon had stopped with Percy's buffers a few inches from his own. But Percy had begun to move. I won't stay here. I'll run away, he puffed. He went straight through Edward's station and was so frightened that he ran right up Gordon's hill without stopping. After that, he was tired, but he couldn't stop. He had no driver to shut off steam and apply the brakes. I want to stop, I want to stop, he puffed. The man in the signal box saw Percy was in trouble, so kindly set the points. Percy puffed wearily onto a nice empty siding, ending in a big bank of earth. He was too tired now to care where he went. I want to stop. I want to stop. I have stopped, he puffed thankfully. Never mind, Percy, said the workman as they dug him out. You shall have a drink and some coal, and then you'll feel better. Presently, Gordon arrived. Well done, Percy. You started so quickly that you stopped a nasty accident. I'm sorry I was cheeky, said Percy. You were clever to stop. One day after pulling the big express, Gordon had arrived back at the sidings very tired. He was just going to sleep when Thomas came up in his cheeky way. Wake up, lazy bones, do some hard work for a change. You can't catch me. And off he ran laughing. Instead of going to sleep again, Gordon thought how he could get back at Thomas. One morning, Thomas wouldn't wake up. His driver and fireman couldn't make him start. His fire went out and there was not enough steam. It was nearly time for the express. People were waiting, but the coaches weren't ready. 
At last, Thomas started. Oh, dear! Oh, dear! He yawned. He fussed into the station where Gordon was waiting. Hurry up, you, said Gordon. Hurry yourself, replied Thomas. Gordon began making his plan. Yes, said Gordon, I will. And almost before the coaches had stopped moving, Gordon reversed quickly and was coupled to the train. Get in quickly, please, he whistled. Thomas usually pushed behind the big trains to help them start, but he was always uncoupled first. This time, Gordon started so quickly they forgot to uncouple Thomas. Gordon's chance had come. Come on, come on, puffed Gordon to the coaches. The train went faster and faster, too fast for Thomas. He wanted to stop, but he couldn't. Peep, peep, stop, stop. Hurry, 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 laughed Gordon. You can't get away, you can't get away, laughed the coaches. Poor Thomas was going faster than he had ever gone before. He was out of breath and his wheels hurt him, but he had to go on. I shall never be the same again, he thought sadly. My wheels will be quite worn out. At last, they stopped at a station. Thomas was uncoupled, and he felt very silly and exhausted. Next, he went on to a turntable, thinking of everyone laughing at him. And then he ran onto a siding out of the way. Well, little Thomas, chuckled Gordon, now you know what hard work means. Henry was ready at five o'clock. There was snow and frost. Men hustled and shouted, loading the vans with crates of fish. The last door banged, the guard showed his green lamp. The flying kipper was ready to go. Come on, come on, don't be silly, don't be silly, puffed Henry to the vans. The vans shuddered and groaned, trock, trick, trock, trick, all right, all right. That is better, that is better, puffed Henry. Clouds of smoke and steam poured from his funnel into the cold air, and the fire's light shone brightly. Hurry, 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 panted Henry. They were going well. The light grew better. The signal light shone green as they passed. Then a yellow signal appeared ahead. His driver prepared to stop. But the home signal was down. All clear, Henry. Away we go. They couldn't know the points from the main line to a siding were frozen, and the home signal should have been set at danger, but snow had forced it down. A goods train was waiting in the siding to let the flying kipper pass, and the driver and fireman were drinking cocoa in the brake van. The kipper is due, said the guard. Who cares, said the fireman. This is good cocoa. The driver got up. Come on, fireman, back to our engine. They got out just in time. Henry's driver and fireman had jumped clear before the crash. But Henry lay dazed and surprised. The fat controller came to see him. The signal was down, sir, said Henry. Cheer up, Henry. It wasn't your fault. Ice and snow caused the accident. I'm sending you to crew a fine place for sick engines. 
They'll give you a new shape and a larger firebox. You'll feel a different engine and won't need special coal anymore. Won't that be nice? Yes, sir, said Henry doubtfully. Wake up, Gordon, said his driver. A special train's coming and where to pull it? Is it coaches or trucks? Trucks, said his driver. Trucks, said Gordon. Puh! Gordon's fire was slow to start, so Edward had to push Gordon to the turntable to get him facing the right way. I won't go, I won't go, grumbled Gordon. Don't be silly, don't be silly, puffed Edward. At last Gordon was on the turntable. The movement had shaken his fire, it was now burning nicely and making steam. Gordon was cross and didn't care what he did. He waited till the table was halfway round. I'll show them, I'll show them, he hissed. He moved slowly forward to jam the table, but he couldn't stop himself and slithered into a ditch. Ooh, she hissed. Get me out! Get me out! Not a hope, said his driver and fireman. You're stuck, you silly great engine. Don't you understand that? They telephoned the fat controller. So Gordon didn't want to take the special train and ran into a ditch? What's that you say? The special's waiting? Tell Edward to take it, please. And Gordon? Oh, leave him where he is. We haven't time to bother with him now. On the other side of the ditch, some little boys were chattering. Cool, doesn't he look silly? They'll never get him out. They began to sing. Silly old Gordon fell in a ditch, fell in a ditch, fell in a ditch. Silly old Gordon fell in a ditch all on a Monday morning. Gordon lay in the ditch all day. Oh dear, he thought, I shall never get out. But that evening they lifted Gordon and made a road of sleepers under his wheels to keep him from the mud. Strong ropes were fastened to his back end and James and Henry, pulling hard, managed to bring him to safety. Late that night, Gordon crawled home, a sadder and wiser engine. Early one morning, a large policeman was sitting close to the line. Thomas liked policemen. He had been a great friend of the constable who had just retired. Peep, peep, he whistled. Good morning. Thomas expected that the new constable would be friendly too, but was sorry to see that he didn't look friendly at all. He was red in the face and very cross. Disgracefully spluttered. I didn't sleep a wink last night. It was so quiet, and now engines come whistling suddenly behind me. I'm sorry, sir, said Thomas. I only said good morning. A policeman pointed to Thomas. Where's your cow catcher, he asked. But I don't catch cows, sir. Don't be funny, snapped the policeman. He looked at Thomas's wheels. No side plates either, and he wrote in his notebook. Engines going on public roads must have their wheels covered and a cow catcher in front to protect people and animals from being dragged under the wheels if they stray onto the line. You haven't, so you are dangerous. Rubbish, said Thomas's driver. We've been along here hundreds of times and never had an accident. That makes it worse, the policeman answered. He wrote regular lawbreaker in his book. Thomas puffed sadly away. The fat controller was having breakfast. He was eating toast and marmalade. The butler came in. Excuse me, sir, you are wanted on the telephone. Bother that telephone, said the fat controller. <laughs> I'm sorry, my dear, he said to his wife. Thomas is in trouble with the police and I must go at once. 
At the station, Thomas's driver told the Fat Controller what had happened. Dangerous to the public, indeed. We'll see about that. The Fat Controller spoke to the policeman. But however much he argued with him, it was no good. The law is the law, he said, and we can't change it. The Fat Controller felt exhausted. I'm sorry, driver, he said. It's no use arguing with policemen. We will have to make those cowcatcher things for Thomas, I suppose. A long stretch of line lay ahead. In the distance was a bridge. It seemed to Gordon that there was something on the bridge. His driver thought so too. Whoa, Gordon, he said and shut off steam. Oh, said Gordon, it's only a cow. Joe, Joe. He moved slowly onto the bridge. But the cow wouldn't shoo. She had lost her calf and felt lonely. Moo, she said sadly. Everyone tried to send her away, but she wouldn't go. Henry arrived. What's this? A cow? I'll soon settle her. Be off, be off. Moo, said the cow. Henry backed away nervously. I don't want to hurt her. At the next station, Henry's guard told them about the cow and warned the signalman that the line was blocked. That must be Bluebell, said the porter. Her calf is here, ready to go to market. Percy will take it along. At the bridge, Bluebell was very pleased to see her calf again, and the porter led them away. Not a word. Keep it dark, whispered Gordon and Henry to each other. They felt rather silly, but the story soon spread. Well, 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 chuckled Edward. Two big engines afraid of a cow. Afraid? Rubbish, said Gordon. We didn't want the poor thing to hurt herself by running up against us. We stopped so as not to excite her. You see what I mean, my dear Edward? Yes, Gordon, said Edward. Gordon felt somehow that Edward saw only too well. The new engine arrived. What's your name? asked the fat controller. Montague, sir, but I'm usually called Duck. They say I waddle. I don't really, sir, but I like Duck better than Montague. Good. Duck it shall be. Here, Percy, show Duck round. The two engines went off together. Soon they were very busy. James, Gordon and Henry watched Duck quietly doing his work. He seems a simple sort of engine. We'll have some fun and order him about. <laughs> Smoke billowed everywhere. Percy was cross. Duck took no notice. They'll get tired of it soon. Do they tell you to do things, Percy? Yes, they do, answered Percy. Right, said Duck. We'll soon stop that nonsense. He whispered something. We'll do it later. The fat controller was looking forward to hot buttered toast for tea at home. Suddenly, he heard an extraordinary noise. Whee! <laughs> Bother, he said, and hurried to the yard. Duck and Percy calmly sat on the points outside the shed, refusing to let the engines in. Gordon, James and Henry were furious. Stop that noise, bellowed the fat controller. They won't let us in. 
hissed Gordon. Duck, explain this behavior. Beg pardon, sir, but I'm a great Western engine. We do our work without fuss. But begging your pardon, sir, Percy and I would be glad if you would inform these um, engines that we only take orders from you. Silence! Snapped the fat controller. Percy and Duck, I am pleased with your work today, but not with your behavior tonight. You have caused a disturbance. Gordon, Henry, and James sniggered. As for you, thundered the fat controller, you've been worse. You made the disturbance. Duck is quite right. This is my railway, and I give the orders. After Percy went away, Duck was left to manage alone. He did so, easily. Today, there was a surprise waiting for Edward in the yard. It was a traction engine. Hello, said Edward. You're not broken and rusty. What are you doing here? I'm Trevor. They're going to break me up next week. What a shame, said Edward. My driver says I only need some paint, polish, and oil to be as good as new. But my master says I'm old-fashioned. Edward snorted. People say I'm old-fashioned, but I don't care. The fat controller says I'm a useful engine. What work did you do? My master would send us from farm to farm. We threshed corn, hauled logs, and did lots of other work. The children loved to see us. Trevor shut his eyes, remembering. Oh, yes, I like children. Edward set off for the station. Broken up, what a shame. Broken up, what a shame. I must help Trevor, I must. He thought of all his friends who liked engines, but strangely, none of them would have room for a traction engine at home. It's a shame, it's a shame, he hissed. Then, beep, beep. Why didn't I think of him before? There, on the platform, was the very person. Hello, Edward. You look upset. What's the matter, Charlie? He asked the driver. There's a traction engine in the scrapyard, Vicar. He'll be broken up next week. Jem Cole says he never drove a better engine. Do save him, sir. He saws wood and gives children rides. We'll see, replied the Vicar. Jem Cole came on Saturday. The Reverend's coming to see you, Trevor. Maybe he'll buy you. Do you think he will, asked Trevor, hopefully. He will when I've lit your fire and cleaned you up. The vicar and his two boys arrived that evening. Trevor hadn't felt so happy for months. He chuffered about the yard. Show your paces, Trevor, said the vicar. Later, he came out of the office smiling. I've got him cheap, Jem, cheap. Do you hear that, Trevor? Cried Jem. The Reverend saved you and you live at the vicarage now. Peep, peep, whistled Trevor. Now Trevor's home is in the vicarage orchard and he sees Edward every day. Daisy was hard to please. She shuddered at the engine shed. This is dreadfully smelly. I'm highly sprung, and anything smelly is bad for my swerves. Next, they tried the carriage shed. This is better said Daisy, but whatever is that rubbish? The rubbish turned out to be Annie Clarabel and Henrietta, who were most offended. We won't stay here to be insulted, they fumed. Percy and Toby had to take them away and spend half the night soothing their hurt feelings.
The engines woke next morning feeling exhausted. Daisy, on the other hand, felt bright and cheerful. Ooh, ooh, she tooted as she came out of the yard and back to the station. Look at me, she purred to the passengers. I am the latest diesel, highly sprung and right up to date. You won't want Thomas's bumpy old Annie and Clarabel now. The passengers waited for Daisy to start, but she didn't. She saw that a milk van was about to be coupled to her and was most indignant. Do they expect me to pull that? Surely, said her driver, you can pull one van. I won't, said Daisy. Percy can do it. He loves messing about with trucks. She began to shudder violently. Nonsense, said her driver. Come on now, back down. Daisy lurched backwards. She was so cross that she blew a fuse. Told you, she said, and stopped. Everyone argued with her, but it was no use. It's Fitter's orders, she said. What is? My Fitter's a very nice man. He comes every week and examines me carefully. Daisy, he says, never, never pull. You're highly sprung and pulling is bad for your swerves. So that's how it is, finished Daisy. One day, Toby brought Henrietta to the station, where Percy was grumpily shunting. Hello, Percy. I see Daisy's left the milk again. I'll have to make a special journey with it, I suppose. Anyone would think I'd nothing to do, grumbled Percy. Tell you what, replied Toby. I'll take the milk. You fetch my trucks. The drivers and the station master agreed. Percy had never been to the quarry before. He began ordering the trucks about. Hurry along, he said. The trucks grumbled to each other. This is Toby's place. Percy's got no right to poke his funnel up here and push us around. They whispered and passed the word. Pay Percy out. Pay Percy out. Come along, puffed Percy. No nonsense. We'll give him nonsense, giggled the trucks. But they followed so quietly that Percy thought they were under control. Suddenly, they saw a notice ahead. All trains stop to pin down brakes. Peep, peep, peep! Brakes, guard, please. But before he could check them, the truck surged forward. On, on, they cried. Help, help, whistled Percy. The man on duty at the crossing rushed to warn traffic with his red flag, but was too late to switch Percy to the runaway siding. Frantically trying to grip the rails, Percy slid into the yard. Peep, peep, look out. The brake van was in smithereens. Percy's driver and fireman had jumped clear, but Percy was stranded. Next day, the fat controller arrived. Toby and Daisy had helped to clear the wreckage, but Percy remained on his perch of trucks. We must now try, said the fat controller, to run the branch line with Toby and a diesel. You have put us in an awkward predicament. I am sorry, sir, replied Percy. You can stay there till we are ready. Perhaps it will teach you to be careful with trucks. Percy sighed. The trucks groaned beneath his wheels. He quite understood about awkward predicaments. Bill and Ben are tank engine twins. Each has four wheels, a tiny chimney and dome, and a small squat cab. Their trucks are filled with china clay. It is needed for pottery, paper, paint, and many other things. The twins are now kept busy pulling the trucks for engines on the main line. 
and for ships in the harbour. One morning, they arranged some trucks and went away for more. They returned to find them all gone. The twins were most surprised. Their drivers examined a patch of oil. That's a diesel, they said. It's a wattle, asked Bill. A diesel, I think, replied Ben. There's a notice about them in our shed. Coughs and sneezels spread diseasels. You had a cough in your smoke box yesterday. It's your fault the diseasel came. It isn't, it is. Stop arguing, you two, laughed their drivers. Let's go and rescue our trucks. Bill and Ben were horrified. But the diseasel will magic us away like the trucks. He won't magic us, replied their drivers. We'll more likely magic him. Listen, he doesn't know your twins. So we'll take away your names and numbers, and then this is what we'll do. Puffing hard, the twins set off on their journey to find the diesel. They were looking forward to playing tricks on him. Creeping into the yard, they found the diesel on a siding with the missing trucks. Ben hid behind, but Bill went boldly alongside. The diesel looked up. Do you mind? Yes, said Bill, I do. I want my trucks, please. These are mine, said the diesel. Go away. Bill pretended to be frightened. You're a big bully, he whimpered. You'll be sorry. He ran back and hid behind the trucks on the other side. Ben now came forward. Truck stealer, hissed Ben. He ran away too. Bill took his place. <laughs> 